have to use the microphone now. My partner's yelling at me. <laughs> so the first woman I'd like to introduce today. Oh, we're still getting music. <laughs> Can I talk over it? <laughs> All right. So the first woman I want to introduce today is, well, she's right here from the Women's Center. And when we started looking for a venue for here, you know, I was looking for local wineries or breweries, and we got the nose because <laughs> there's still a stigma around cannabis. And that's part of what we're trying to do here today is break the stigma that goes around cannabis. And there's also a stigma around women's reproductive health. So kind of once we thought of the Women's Center as a venue, it just made the most sense that we can work on breaking all the stigmas together here as women. So I really am so glad for you guys hosting us. And I'd like to introduce our first panelist, Roxanne Sataki. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out to the Women's Center today. Um, as Heather said, my name is Roxanne Sataki, and I serve as the Director of Community Engagement for the Women's Centers. So the Women's Centers is actually a group of independent abortion providers. Um, we're today coming to you live from Cherry Hill Women's Center. So we are an ambulatory surgical center facility that specializes in first and second trimester abortion care. We also have a total of five centers. Um, so we actually have two offices in Pennsylvania, one in Connecticut, and then one in Atlanta, Georgia. So we have a lot of, you know, understanding of kind of the ways that different laws state by state and on the federal level can kind of challenge care provision when it comes to women's reproductive health and abortion specifically. The Cherry Hill Women's Center, where we are today, uh, is one of the main facilities for folks seeking abortion care in South Jersey. We actually have a large number of people that come to us from out of state, but also all over the state. Um, and we're the closest provider for a lot of people all the way as south as Cape May. So the office that you are located in right now is our family lobby. Um, a lot of people kind of think about someone having an abortion in that one moment in their life, but we know that people who have abortions are oftentimes parents. Actually, more than half of the people that we take care of already have at least one child. Um, so this space specifically is usually set up with like lots of kids' toys and things, um, and it's a space where people can hang out and wait, you know, for their loved one while they're having services. We also are an independent provider, um, which is a little bit different than what you might think of like a Planned Parenthood. It means that we're independent of a larger kind of like national organization or we're separate from a hospital setting. And independent providers across the United States are often um, the providers that are seeing people in states that are most hostile to abortion. In states where there's like one provider left, they're usually an indie or an indie clinic as we call ourselves. Um, independent providers actually care for three out of five people that have abortions in the United States, but they're just kind of usually fly under the radar and not thought of. Um, so I really welcome all of you coming here. I appreciate the opportunity to kind of show you our space and tell you a little bit about us. Um, and I'm very excited to learn, you know, about women and we, and you know, from all these people um, in the community. I'm giving a little bit of a different perspective today. I'm going to speak just specifically to my expertise, which is um, the women's health perspective. But I think there's a lot of like, intersections and overlap, um, especially when you start to look at the history. Um, so for the folks that are in the room, there's some artwork here on the side that we um, got from a person named Heather All that does a lot of um, art around women's health and contraception and abortion. Um, and this was from a series called 4,000 Years for Choice. So as long as people have been having pregnancies, people have been having abortions. Every you know culture, every um, civilization that you can research, there's some kind of methods of contraception or abortion that have been you know well documented throughout time. In the United States, abortion was common. It was you know, easily accessible up until actually about like the 1880s. So when the Constitution was signed, people were able to access abortions without restriction. At the end of the 1800s, we started to see the criminalization of abortion. Um, and that was coming from kind of two places, both steeped in patriarchy and white supremacy. So one was kind of a cultural push in the United States to criminalize abortion because Anglo-Saxon women weren't reproducing fast enough. And there was this concern that, you know, immigrants were going to take over the country. And so it really was a push, um, you know, to try to keep America white. And so that, you know, push against um, abortion was one to control, you know, women and their reproductive decision making, but also really, um, again, steeped in that kind of like white supremacist hetero patriarchy. 
Um, we also saw pushback from coming from the medical community. Traditionally, abortion and birth work was done by community birth workers, often women of color in the United States. And there was a push in like the late 1800s, early 1900s to make all medical care the sphere of uh, professional physicians, which often were white men. <laughs> And so the work of birth started becoming more hospitalized. If you listen to like doulas, um, you know, there's a lot of issues around that and kind of how, you know, maternal health started to suffer when it was coming out of that community setting. But abortion was actually just kind of relinquished to the outskirts. They said it was immoral and unsafe. Um, and so by 1910, most states had a law criminalizing abortion. And so through the late 1800s, early 19th, 1900s, um, we saw a rise in back alley abortions or, you know, dangerous criminalized abortions. Um, a lot of people died. A lot of people were injured because there wasn't access to a medical provider. And the folks that were providing care were doing it in clandestine settings um, without, you know, access to what they needed to make sure that that care was, um, was safe. And so... Fast forward a little bit. You guys are probably familiar with Roe versus Wade. We just had the 47th anniversary of Roe. Um, and that was a case that made abortion legal nationwide. Uh, but kind of like what you see with cannabis, state by state, laws were already passing um, in different places. So our Philadelphia Women's Center opened up in 72, right? It was the first abortion provider in Pennsylvania. Um, but Roe versus Wade was 1973. And that's when in every state in the United States, you could safely, legally access an abortion in a medical facility. Over the years, though, we've seen um, a lot of pushes to criminalize abortion again and just criminalize pregnancy. And there's been a rollback of the protections of Roe. Almost immediately um, after Roe, there was a law that passed called the Hyde Amendment that's been upheld every single year um, since 1976. And what that did was it said that no federal funding could be used for the cost of abortion, abortion education, provision. And so immediately, people who utilized the Medicaid system were stripped of access to care. Right. And so before Roe, if you had a lot of means, you could fly to New York and get an abortion. After Roe, that was supposed to be fixed. But now because people don't have financial resources, the care was being pushed further away and still is, you know, especially for our most marginalized community members. We also have seen Supreme Court cases that say that states can regulate abortion differently than other medical procedures. And so we have things like trap laws, which are laws that target abortion clinics, but not other comparable medical procedures and don't do anything to increase the safety of patient outcomes, but make it really difficult to provide care. And so these are things like mandating the size of the hallway in a clinic or the type of provider that can do abortions, even if it's not, you know, a medical necessity. Um, and so more and more providers are closing, more and more people live in communities without access to abortion. Um, and right now we actually on the horizon see um, a Supreme Court case, June uh, versus June versus Guy Medical Services, which is coming up March 4th. Um, and that will likely see another kind of rollback to abortion rights. Um, we also have seen a changing um, structure of the Supreme Court. So we know now that there is a different makeup on the court than there was in Roe versus Wade in some of the cases that have been heard around abortion more recently. And we actually are facing um, probably the most realistic time frame of Roe being overturned than we have since 1973. So a lot of states right now are working to do things like codify Roe. There are states that are very hostile to abortion that have laws on the books that actually, if Roe versus Wade would fall, would criminalize abortion in their state immediately. There are states who are doing the opposite and say if Roe falls on the national level, their state would protect abortion. New Jersey is a state that has long been a leader in reproductive health and abortion care. So we um, have opted to use state funds to allow folks who utilize the medical, um, the Medicaid program for their care to be able to use that for abortion. We don't have a lot of the trap laws in statute like we see in some other hostile states, though we do have some restrictions that actually live in a place called the Board of Medical Examiners that do very much what a trap law would do, but they exist in the Consumer Affairs um, Department in New Jersey. And so we are looking forward to um, seeing New Jersey move towards a space where we're codifying Roe, so codifying the right to abortion and ensuring that this is something that people can access regardless of what's going on uh, on the federal level. So excited about that. Um, Cherry Hill Women's Center is involved with a lot of groups throughout the state in a coalition called Thrive New Jersey. It's an organizational coalition, so organizations can sign on, become involved, do advocacy. We've been working around um, the... Uh, 
dignity for incarcerated caregivers, though, who worked for driver's license for undocumented folks, all things that we kind of see as barriers to access to living a full um, reproductive, you know, full life. Um, I think there are a lot of intersections in between advocacy around cannabis and, and advocacy around abortion. Um, and a lot of it really is steeped in stigma, right? So folks who are uh, against abortion have often spoken out and kind of dominated the narrative. So we try to do a lot of work to be um, very forward, speak about abortion, say the word abortion instead of like reproductive rights or something like that, because we want to make space for people to be able to talk about their experiences. We know it's very common. Um, we know that about one in four women by the time she's 45 will have access to an abortion sometime in her life. So, you know, we want people to be able to make these decisions for themselves based on what's best for them, not on the conditions in which, you know, the community is sustaining or what a politician says they should or should not be able to do. And I think a lot of it comes down to um, kind of our government being taken over by this like puritanical idea that people can't experience pleasure, right? Abortion's a medical procedure. Cannabis can be a medical option, but there also is, you know, room in our lives as whole people to be able to enjoy ourselves and, you know, be fully human. And I think for women, that's always been kind of squashed to a certain extent. Um, so this idea of like criminalizing pleasure, I think, is um, a space where, you know, there's a lot of room to kind of stand up and stand in a space that is, um, you know, just really honest and, you know, kind of pushes back and fights back around some of that stigma. So I will wrap it up. But I did just want to say, if you're interested in getting involved in this work, um, I do have a sign up where if you want to, you know, sign up for the Cherry Hill Women's Center email list, you can hear about what we're doing. Um, if you're interested in getting involved as a clinic escort, we actually have a lot of volunteers. So speaking to that stigma, uh, there are a large number of protesters that stand outside of this facility when people are accessing care very regularly and scream in their faces and videotape them and, you know, hold signs and make them feel very uncomfortable. So I think whatever you feel about, you know, the idea of abortion for yourself, thinking about how people are treated when they're accessing that care, you know, that's a really a place where you can do a lot of good. And I always tell folks that when they're volunteering, it's like you have the immediate impact on the person that you're supporting when you're entering the facility, but you're also working to break down some of that stigma. Because every person that drives down King's Highway, if all they ever see is people shouting about how bad abortion is, it really starts to feed into this, you know, context about well, what is abortion? Is it really bad? We know that most people, you know, when someone has made the decision to have an abortion, they want it to be safe, they want it to be in their community, and they want people to be supported. So just by staying outside in your colorful pro-choice test, it also starts to break down some of that commu uh, community stigma that we hold. I also work in the um, sphere of a nonprofit called New Jersey Abortion Access Fund. So abortion funds exist in like a state in the U.S. They work to try to mitigate some of that damage caused by the Hyde Amendment. Um, in New Jersey, because we have Medicaid access, we primarily are funding folks who are underinsured with high deductibles, uh, people who are coming to New Jersey from out of state, and also undocumented folks who have no access to any type of insurance. Um, so we're doing a fundraiser. It's called Choose to Love and Love to Choose, and that's going to be held in Princeton, New Jersey on February 9th. Um, so I have some flyers. We'd welcome you to attend. We also are doing like ad space in the book, another great way to break down stigma and start to build um, you know, some of these relationships, I think, between movements. So I thank you for your time. All right, thank you, Roxanne. That was awesome. So the next awesome woman that I want to bring up, I had this idea because I am a medical patient. And just being in the community, I kind of started noticing it's the, most of the voices are men. You know, it's just the way that it is. And some of those voices are very misogynistic. And it's not necessarily a safe place for women to talk about our issues all the time. So that's when I had this idea of I wanted to have a women-centric event. So I was just at my prescribing doctor, and I started talking to the uh, manager of the office. And I'm like, wouldn't it be awesome if we could do something, if we could make this happen where women can get together and talk about what are our opportunities, what are our challenges, what are our successes. And this woman, she heard my idea. It wasn't even a fully fledged idea. Yet. <laughs> it was a concept. And she's like, we're in. <laughs> and we're sponsoring. So we would not be here today if it were not for Canacare Doctors. They're our main sponsor for this event. They're the ones that really enable us to all be here today. And Dana, my next speaker, uh, you're the regional Regional Marketing Manager for Canacare Docs. <laughs> All right, so our next speaker, Dana Balka. 
Okay. So as Heather said, we met in my office. Um, I'm also a medical marijuana patient myself. And I have actually been using cannabis since 1993 as medicine, way before anybody else. And probably for about 23 years, nobody even believed me that it worked. Like my family, my parents, nobody. But here we are. And obviously it works not only for me, but for, I've seen miracles um, that have happened, with, you know, the plant and people using it on a daily basis. That's really what it comes down to is the everyday use. That's where you get the full benefit of the plant. Um, and I've been helping people now for four and a half years to get their medical marijuana card in New Jersey. I'm all over the state, as Diane knows. <laughs> now both states, actually. Um, County Care Doctors, we are in 14 states, maybe 17 now. On the East Coast, we're um, from Maryland all the way up to like Maine. So Erica, in my area is New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Maryland. So between those states, I think we have nine offices. So we are actually the largest provider of patient registries in the world, County Care Doctors is. So, and then on top of that, um, our parent, a company called CB2 Insights, they do a lot of research on medical cannabis. So it kind of loops the whole thing together. And, uh, you know, it's, um, it's just one of those things where there's a big stigma and I'm very in, out in the open about it. And I think the more women that are out in the open, the more we could break that, you know, stigma. Because people, you know, definitely, they're afraid to talk about it. And it's not going anywhere. I mean, it, it was legal for so long. It was used as medicine for a long time. And it really just goes back to the government deciding, we're going to feed them poison pills. That's what I, you know, we're going to do population control, give them poison pills, make them sick, keep them coming back, instead of keeping people healthy. So, um, that's a little bit about me. I'm a big advocate. I am a big fan of medical marijuana. Um, it's interesting. My grandmother was a big user and she lived to be like 95. So it just, I always look at her and I'm like, well, she used a lot of marijuana. Like, you know, she was hitting a vape. I mean, all, and she just, you know, lived her life healthy. So um, there's definitely advantages for it. It's just a shame that it is classed as a federal one drug when cocaine is a schedule two drug, I, I just, I can't, I can't grasp that. So um, anyway, so Canicare doctors, what we do is we help people get their medical marijuana cards so they can obtain legal cannabis in New Jersey or any of the other states that we're in. So that way, you know, your medicine, where you're buying it, what's in it, you know, all the things that you really don't know when you buy it on the street. And we have a network of doctors. So you know, in all of our offices, we educate, we have doctors, we, you know, are going to start holding classes. Um, we're going to start carrying CBD, just all different types of stuff, you know, just to help people better themselves. Um, and we really have seen, you know, miracles and minors, we do minors for no charge. So there's a lot of minors with epilepsy seizures. I mean, it's done miracles for a lot of, a lot of minors as well. Um, that's you know pretty much in a nutshell. I know in New Jersey, we have six dispensaries right now. New Jersey, for as, as advanced as we are, we really are behind in the medical marijuana program. There's no edibles. Two dispensaries make oil. One sells them to the other. You only have the flower. So really they're kind of saying to you, go smoke it <laughs> because there's no other form where like you go over to Pennsylvania, they have a whole way of stuff, right? They have everything that's it but that's all that we have and I mean people have to drive two three hours just to go and you know get the lozenges because they don't have them anywhere else and then there's six more dispensaries coming well where are they I mean it's been like a year and a half so you know it's there's a lot of you know patients that leave New Jersey and go up to Rhode Island and Washington DC even though it's illegal to bring it back they could still legally buy it there. And the quality of medicine is just night and day. I mean, you're not even comparing apples to apples. And then you have states like New York where there is no flour. So you have New Jersey, only flour, and then New York, no flour, and then PA has everything, you know, it's like. 
So I don't know if anybody has any questions or who has their medical marijuana cards or who's thinking about getting their medical marijuana cards. But if you use marijuana now, cannabis, you should really get yourself, you know, the medical marijuana card if you qualify and get access to legal cannabis. What are some of the qualifying conditions and how do you go about? So do you live in, in New Jersey? So in New Jersey, there's maybe, I think we're up to 19 now. Um, from anxiety, PTSD, chronic pain, migraines, the Crohn's, the epilepsy, seizures, AIDS, H HIV, MS. Um, I know I'm, I'm missing quite a few in there, but cancer, I, I hate saying that word. <laughs> I was like, but there's a lot in there. Um, but ever since they opened up the chronic pain area, that seems to pretty much, you know, has so much anxiety, the PTSD, um, Insomnia is not a qualifier in New Jersey. You have intractable muscular spasticity, um, wasting syndrome, fibromyalgia falls under a couple of different things. So there's a lot of you know different things. Um, and believe it or not, they don't really advertise this, but they actually add period cramps in New Jersey. <laughs> That's like one of those things that just like snuck up on the list. So. <laughs> Yeah, so that's on the list also. So really you just need to obtain a medical record from your current doctor for any one of those qualifying conditions. And then you bring it in and um, you know we will educate you and you'll see the doctor and it's not covered by insurance though. So it, it is an out-of-pocket expense. If you come across any doctors charging insurance, they're definitely being a little shady or finagling the system somehow. So, um, you know, it's... But yeah, I mean, it's a very simple process. It takes about two to three weeks from the time that you come in to when you have your actual card in your hand. Yeah. Right, we will have time for questions. Yeah. Questions yep. at the end. Yep. So we have one. That's a nutshell on so Canna Care Docs. <laughs> yep. So any questions? That you have, yeah. All right. Let's hear it for Dana. <laughs> <laughs> So our next woman that I wanted to introduce here, uh, right, Ital, Ital, uh, Ital Gardens is the name of her organization. And my first conversation I had with her, we were talking about justice. And that's something I really think we need to talk about a lot. Like, you know, we know medically it helps us, but we all need to talk about the justice and the lack of justice we've been seeing in cannabis up until this point in time. We know there's a huge racial bias in who gets arrested for this plant, who serves time in jail. And now we see, you know, there's a huge class bias of who's allowed to sell and who's not allowed to sell. You know, people that have been the black market that's been serving us for so long, they're out of it now. They're not allowed to be a part of it. And people are coming in and you have to have millions of dollars to be able to get one of these licenses. So there's some real class injustice too. So that's why the first conversation we had, and I knew that you had to be a part of this as soon as I talked to you, because that's what we talked about. <laughs> so I'd like to welcome Suzanne from Mytel Gardens. Thank you, thank you. So my name is Suzanne Nicholson. I'm Jamaican born. I want to introduce my business partner as part of our company. I have my business partner, Mary Ellen Tatey, in the audience. You wave your hand. My other business partner, Rachel Ludwig. And another good colleague, Diane Nickerson, formerly of Cash Eye Security. Thank you all for coming out. I just want to start about um, more about me. So um, everything I learned about cannabis, I learned from my mother. We come from generational growers. So on the great, beautiful island of Jamaica, I come from a place called Westmoreland. And I would say, hands down, it's probably the best soil to grow the best ganja in the world that you've probably been smoking for the 60s and 70s. So my mother, um, Elaine Cohen, God rest her soul, um, she was a model. And she was in the Bahamas on a photo shoot. And she was finishing work. And a gentleman by the name of my father, Joseph H. Cohen, um, saw her and said that she was the most beautiful woman in the world. And at the time that they had met in the early 70s, my father's Caucasian, um, Jewish. My mother's Jamaican Indian. It was a very controversial relationship. So there was no social media. There was no Instagram, pen and paper. But through that first contact meeting, they dated. And out of that dating relationship produced three beautiful children. So in Jamaica, as many of you know, um, cannabis and ganja is not illegal. Uh, we grow it. 
use it for variety of medicinal, social, and spiritual um, uses, and as, as well culinary. So my parents and I, we came to America in 1975. It's a little bit about my dad. My dad was a law enforcement officer. He was a sheriff officer. So when my mom and him met, he knew from coming to Jamaica and touring the farms um, that we grew cannabis as well as other things. In that conversation coming to America, my mother always says eclectically, she had us, the children, she had one of her plants and she had some good ganja seeds and, and the suitcase. On top of that, my father was a sheriff officer with the sheriff dog, Junction. So we get to America in December and it's winter. We've never seen snow. So my mother said she couldn't wait till the soil grew a little bit warmer so she can start planting in the way back of the property. So you can imagine that eventually um, our beautiful dog function ratted my mother out. My father tells the story of one day the dog running back to the back of the property and then him coming upon great bushels of ganja, as he would say. And having a very stern conversation with my mother saying, hey, you know, not only am I a sheriff officer working for Atlantic County, um, owning a sheriff dog, this is illegal. And not only could you go to jail, but I could lose my job and my pension and all that we work for. So my mother made him a promise while he was living that she would not grow cannabis in America. But upon my father's death, my mother went right back to <laughs> growing cannabis. So cannabis was a regular part of my household, but we knew in our household because it was illegal that my mother could get in trouble. We didn't talk about it. But my mother was known in the community if anyone had stomach pains, probably irritable bowel syndrome back in the day. My mother would make potions and tonics and she would give them to her friends. They would come over, mother would use um, beeswax and she would make candles. She would show me how to make tonics and teas, homemade things we would use in our flowers, we would use them butters and oils. These things I thought were normal growing up until I start meeting other people and then realizing the thing that we respect in our household is very illegal. So fast forward to, I get a call. I'm in uh, Seton Hall Law School in 1996. My mother gets diagnosed with cancer. So I come home. And in me coming home, my mother battled with cancer up until she passed in 2013. And one of the things that I know that kept her from 1996, when they said that she had less than a year to live, again, she passed in 2013, was cannabis. So with that, um, the plant was very important. I remember my mother in, in New Jersey, if you remember, um, the laws were very restrictive. We didn't really have the great medicinal program that we have currently. And I remember getting a call that my mother was in the hospital and I needed to meet with her doctors. And speaking with her doctor was kind of a strange conversation because my mother was very upset. And she kept saying, they're, they keep saying, Susie, that I'm using street drugs. And as I drove to the hospital, I started to think, oh, cannabis. That's what they probably constitute as street drugs. So talking to the doctors, I said, you know, um, what was in my mother's blood system? And then they said THC. And I smiled and I said, okay, that was it, correct? And they said, yeah. I said, okay, well, let me come in the room and talk to you when you talk to my mother. My mother was a very proud woman. And she was very offended that someone would refer to her as using street drugs because again, cannabis to her was a very spiritual plant. So in having the conversation, I said, okay, what was in my mother's system? And the doctor said THC. And I said, what's another name for that? And then he said, cannabis. And I said, what's another street name? And he said, marijuana. So my mother starts laughing. She says, yeah, man, ganja. I mean, there's enough ganja around here. So from that conversation, the doctors who were treating her that needed to have forthright and honest conversations about her medical care knew that she was going to use cannabis, more than likely couldn't smoke it because of the condition, but it was something that became um, powerful and engaging to where they formed a relationship, a very honest and authentic relationship where my mother was very free to talk about her use of cannabis. I say that in um, this, that it was very sad to know that in my mother's death that she could not benefit to see how far New Jersey has grown. So in this, um, I am a public servant, proud public servant. And in looking toward the latter part of my career, I started to think about what really makes me happy. And I always go back to cannabis. So in that, I said, you know, in the last couple of years, you know, what do I want to see as a reflection in New Jersey's market? I want to see a reflection of not only me, but women. 
I often say that when I go out, I'm more likely the only woman of color in the space talking about cannabis, trying to educate individuals about cannabis. But the war on drugs did not forget about the communities that look like me. Communities of color are more than one to four times to have a contact with law enforcement around cannabis. And as we know, whites and blacks and other minorities use cannabis at the same rate. But yet in the great state of New Jersey, our incarceration rates are vastly disparate to those of color. Also, looking at the opportunities economic here for social justice, you have a lot of black and brown people who sit in jail today for what I choose to do legally. It's appalling. And how do we change these laws? In order to change these laws, we have to look at advocacy. I think advocacy is a key to what we need to do here. So in that passion for social justice, I've met individuals like Dr. Kathy from Stockton um, that also is one of the first programs here in the state of New Jersey to talk about cannabis and offer a cannabis education program, but also to be founded in social justice. Most of the business owners that work in the cannabis space are predominantly male and predominantly white. Great things, but we need to have equity at the table. In order to have equity, we need to have opportunities. I want to demystify this. I started in my bedroom with no money. Again, in my bedroom with no money, and I stand here today. I tell you that because it's important to know that I just submitted the last round of application, uh, application for a dispensary right here in Camden County. So real dreams do come true, but hard work is very important. Expungement is a big piece of how we provide advocacy. We have to go to our legislators and demand legalization here in New Jersey. One of the things that are coming up in 2020, one of the huge things is the referendum on legalization. Unfortunately, in 2019, we were not able to get enough of a possible yes votes. So Senator Sweeney pulled it from going to vote. It was very disappointing to many of us who may sit in this room, but I wanna keep you encouraged. Part of our advocacy, we need to ensure that women, minorities, and veterans, those who sacrifice and give their lives for our country have an opportunity and equity at the table. The only company that's currently a woman company is a company in um, Galloway, Best of Ola's company female owned. But Ms. Devola has been very blessed along with other great women in this industry. But in order to have more women, men, minorities, and veterans in this industry, we have to participate in great networking and opportunities like this. So I can talk about cannabis probably for another three hours. So if you have any questions um, in a few minutes, I'll be free to have you to answer them. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was awesome. <laughs> so we're going to change things up a little bit next. Okay. How many people in here have heard of Weed Man? Show of hands. <laughs> How many people have been to Weed Man's joint in Trenton? How many people here know it's owned by a woman? Not a whole lot of people, right? <laughs> but and Weed Man's joint is owned by a woman. And she's right here with us. This is Debbie. Uh, I've known her quite a while now. We've been doing some of our other forums. We had Weed Man, and that was honestly, you know, it just shows we have some very. Hmm? <laughs> you know, we see there's some very powerful voices, but a lot of the women's voices are not being centered and not being highlighted. And people are surprised when they hear it's a woman that owns the joint. So I'm so excited to have her here to talk to us today. Let's all welcome Debbie. Hello. My name is Debbie Medeo. I'm uh, just a little bit of my background. I'm an RN, BSN. I also have a uh, Bachelor's of Science of Criminal Justice Administration. In um, 2014, I went to the first cannabis conference in Trenton, New Jersey, as a nurse um, with Jenny Storms, who son is Jackson Storms, has um, Dravet syndrome. We both are the parents of handicapped children that would benefit from cannabis. That's how I got uh, involved in the movement. When I went down there, I met a whole cast of characters, oh my God, larger than life people, and NJ Weedman. 
So um, we talked back and forth on Facebook and he put a, a thing out that he wanted to open a business. And I said, what better a person to start a business with than NJ Wee Man? Because I knew nothing about him. So in 2015, I didn't finish his book. I should have finished the book. In 2015, we, we decided to open NJ Weed Man's joint. So we looked around in Trenton and we came upon this building and it was right across from City Hall. So I said, this is great. So neither one of us had ever opened a restaurant, worked in a restaurant, have any experience with a restaurant, but there was a restaurant there. I said, this is great. We're gonna open a restaurant. So we opened a restaurant. We opened a lounge, which actually follows the Kuma guidelines. We opened um, an event venue. So we were like, you know, progressive thinkers. We think everybody's going to embrace this. And they did for a while. But then, you know, things got, I don't know if you know our whole story, but things got ugly with us. My, my partner ended up doing a whole bunch of time in jail. We closed down. We opened it back up. So we're not going to stop because we are coming from a different angle of, and I'm not gonna say cannabis because when I grew up and when I was 16 years old and when I was smoking weed and I smoked for 10 years, it was weed, it was marijuana before it was whitewashed by the industry to make it okay. The government lied to me and told me it was bad. It put my friends in prison. It took away a lot of things from a lot of people. Now, all of a sudden, the government is telling me it's great. It's cannabis. It's weed. It's marijuana. And like we say, and we have a big sign, like NJ Weedman says, fuck the law, smoke it anyway. I keep smoking it. I don't give a shit because <laughs> it is weed and it should have always been legal. But you have to realize that we were lied to. So the industry in New Jersey that's coming in, and we call them cannabaggers because they're taking advantage of the people the victims of the war on drugs. Who's a victim? Who's the biggest victim in New Jersey of the war on drugs? NJ Weedman, because he was arrested for selling marijuana, which now all of a sudden Phil Murphy says is great. Phil Murphy talks about uh, cannabis and marijuana in the state of New Jersey, and he can sit there and he can have a job. I can't get a job with the state of New Jersey because I talk about legalization for everybody. And like she said, social equity. My partner was uh, persecuted, prosecuted, and now excluded from the cannabis industry. I couldn't even get a license to apply for anything because he's a felon. And he's a felon because of laws that were targeted at people of color. Jim Crow laws. It's the same thing if you, the difference between crack cocaine and cocaine, what's the difference? The user, one is white, one is a person of color and in the inner city. So you see all these things like Curio is coming to Trenton. They're spending, I think, $22 million to come to Trenton. Are they going to hire any of these people, the victims the, of the war on drugs? No, because they don't hire felons. Felons are excluded. So we just keep doing our thing. So we have our restaurant, which is marijuana themed. Everything is shaped like a weed leaf. Everything has weed all over it. We have sanctuary where if you are a medical patient, and I am a medical patient in the state of New Jersey, can I use my medicine? And I think all marijuana use is medicinal. But you need it to relax, you want to chill, you want to have a good time, you want to do some yoga, you can just do it. And it's all medicinal. So everybody uses it because they need to use it. And if it helps you relax, that's fine. So we have always followed Kuma guidelines. Can I smoke my medicine in the state of New Jersey? No, as a nurse, because I'm not going to get a job. And if you think you have job protection, you don't. Okay, that that's a bunch of crap. I'll tell you right now. So we have the, the we also have an event venue and we have, well, of course, we have a big Grateful Dead event because they like to smoke weed. We have hip hop events. We have everything. We have yoga. We have all kinds of stuff. And it's all like minded people and everybody comes together. We just opened a smoke shop. But in New Jersey, we're excluded from the cannabis industry. I'm excluded from the cannabis industry. I I'm excluded. I can't apply. My business partner can't apply. And like I said, we thought when we opened it, oh, we're such progressive thinkers. Everybody's going to think we're so great. Well, they didn't. They didn't think we were so great. And, and I don't understand it. It's, like, it's just mind boggling. Marijuana is coming to New Jersey. But it's coming as a conglomeration. It's coming as a corporation. It's coming as suit and ties. Where's all the hippies? Where's all the free thinkers? Where's all the weed smokers? 
Where are they? Yeah, and you're excluded. There you go. I stand up. But it, but it shouldn't be that a suit and a tie now. It shouldn't be a suit and a tie. And those people, like I said, I don't need somebody to lab test my weed. I don't need somebody to tell me I'm too stupid in New Jersey to grow my own weed. That's what they're telling me. I can grow a tomato. Why can't I grow weed? Why can't I? And I can tell you that I know people. And if somebody's been selling weed for 30, 40 years and has gone to prison for selling weed, and is a, basically a weed connoisseur expert, now they can't sell weed in New Jersey. So, so there's a lot of there's a lot of work that needs to be done on legalization here because as far as I'm concerned, it's not legal. It's almost like big pharma. The big pharmaceuticals, they can make a Percocet, they can sell a Percocet. If I make a Percocet and sell a Percocet, I'm still going to prison. So if I grow some weed and I sell some weed, I'm going to prison. How is that legal? My partner already went to prison. He can, he actually just got arrested the other day. Why do we have to be afraid? Yes, with weed. He got arrested with weed. So why? how is that legalization? How is it legalization? And then we asked the guy, Curia, we went to the thing. Are you going to hire felons? Oh, I don't know the laws in the state of New Jersey. You don't spend $22 million and not know the laws in the state of New Jersey. You know, people say, oh, at least it's legal. You won't get arrested. They don't realize you're still going to get arrested. You're still getting arrested. You're still going to go to prison. My friends, like I said, my friends had their lives ruined by a plant, a plant, like something that was natural, something that was wholesome, something that was meant for good. So that being said, most people talking about NG Weed Man's Joint don't realize that I am a driving force behind NG Weed Man's Joint. When Ed was locked up, he was locked up for 447 days. I kind of didn't know what I was doing, but I had to jump in there. Shut the place down, redo everything, you know, just, just get everything under control. Okay, I'm probably a control freak. I have my hand in everything. But I think as a woman, I'm constantly saying, I own the place. I own the place. I own the place. Oh, yeah, I own the place. I don't know if it's just because I'm a woman, but then again, I have a business partner that everybody knows who's larger than life. I mean, and you try to stand next to a person who's larger than life. And sometimes you kind of get lost in that. And, and people will come in, they automatically do like this. And look, and I always say, I'm like, and he'll give people a tour around. I said, you know, I'm not only the cleaning lady, I said, but sometimes I don't make it on the tour. I do own the place. So I, it's something that, like I said, you would think, you know, I'm a progressive thinker. It's legalization is coming, but it's not that way. And it needs to change in the state of New Jersey. People, like she said, there is no social justice. There is no social equity. There is nothing put in place to help those people that were the victims. They should be the first in line. They should be the first in line to get a license, but they're not. And like I said, they're excluded. And that's the problem with, with New Jersey's legalization. And, and I knew when Phil Murphy was coming in, I said, there's going to be seven white people. There's seven places to get marijuana in the state of New Jersey. Where's everybody else getting their weed from? <laughs> Where's everybody else getting it? I'm not going to tell you where they're getting from. <laughs> I don't need to tell you where they're getting their weed from. <laughs> But all I'm saying is that you can go to a New Jersey dispensary and you can pay $500 for an ounce of shitty weed. It's not good. And you can't get an edible and you can't get a tincture and you can't get a lollipop. And where's everybody getting those from? Where are they getting those gummy bears? Where are they getting the drinks? Where are they getting the tinctures? Where are they getting the chocolates? Where are they getting those bars? Where are they getting them? I'm not going to tell you where they're getting them. <laughs> But I mean, it's out there. And I guess I kind of am on the black market side, but I don't want to be on the black market side. I want to be legal. I want to be able to, to, to sell. I want to have a mom and pop shop just like I have a tobacco license where we sell all the different, you know, rolls and games and frontal leaves. I want to be able to apply for that and have a little mom and pop shop and be able to get weed wherever I want and sell it. But that's... Even those places, they're going to restrict where you can buy it from. So I can buy it from the shitty dispensary for $500 and have to sell it to you for 1000 That doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. So, so the program, it's not right in New Jersey. So we, like I said, we just do our own thing. But 
as a woman and as women, I mean, I think that we have to like, you know, women are supposed to be, I shouldn't say stereotypical. We're supposed to be compassionate and, and, and just, you know, have the understanding of people and, and, you know, try to, 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 to foster that relationship that everybody deserves a chance. And especially those people that were on the front lines. These people were on the front lines of the drug war. We run, won the drug war. We won it. Legalization's coming. But why does Scotari and, and Phil Murphy, why did, are they making the rules for us? We, we won the war. We were the victims. We were the soldiers. We were out there saying legalize, legalize. It's legal. But they are making all the rules for us and excluding us. No, there isn't a regular person. Let me on there. They don't want to hear from me. They don't want to hear from me. And, and here's another thing. The state of New Jersey. Give me a job, the state of New Jersey. They won't even give me a job. No. They're, they're, and here's the thing. If legalization is coming, isn't Scotari a prosecutor and still prosecute people for marijuana? That doesn't make sense. It doesn't. So New Jersey doesn't make sense. So, so in conclusion, my whole thing in New Jersey is, like I said, they're coming in as a big conglomeration, as a corporation, as a suit and tie to, 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 to take over. And weed isn't just, it's not just a plant. Like she said, her mother used this plant. It's a culture. So if you come to NJ Weed Man's Joint, we're the cannabis culture. We're the culture. I mean, we were the potheads. We were the hippies. And I can tell you this. What they say about hippies and, and potheads and all that, it's not true. I can sit on the couch and I'll have three people sitting next to me at any given time that have a PhD. And here's these people, they're in their 60s, so they totally did not fit that stereotype of your pothead that sits on the couch in the mother's basement. But if you talk to these people with their PhD, they'll start talking about their plants and how they grow them and all this stuff and everything else, and they know more than the, these other people that, that have the whole industry. Why do they get the whole industry? That's what I want to know. If somebody knows Phil Murphy, ask them. Why can't I have my piece? Why can't I? But why do I need money? All I need is a seed. All I need is a seed and some dirt. Yeah. But but why do why do I have to give you hundred and twenty thousand dollars? All I need to do is buy a seed and get some dirt. There you go. But it's but it's crazy. It's crazy. I don't need it to be tested. You know. You know. You. I guarantee you, everybody in here bought weed for years before legalization came to Maryland, to, to, to New Jersey. Where did everybody buy the weed 50 years ago? Where did I buy it 40 years ago? I bought it from, from the weed, you know, whoever my local weed man was, yeah. And I knew, like, the stuff he got, and if it wasn't good, it was sticks and stems. I went someplace else, so you knew. New Jersey isn't doing that. Like, other states model where, where mom and pops have an opportunity. In New Jersey, there's no opportunity. It's, it's been stolen away from the culture. And, and it just, like I said, we're just going to do what we do. I don't want to be on the black market side. I don't want to be. I want to be legal. Yeah. They still Yes, but you're still facing the risk of going to prison. So why can somebody standing over there in a suit and tie, Curio from, from Baltimore, why can he grow and sell? <laughs> well, that's the whole thing. But but the thing is that in the meantime, an arrest, and New Jersey can't get 12. They can't. But in the meantime, they can ruin your life. And they can take everything that you have. And if you think they won't, they will. But like I said, why does Mr. So-and-so over here in a suit and a tie get to grow a plant, get to sell a plant, get to make a whole bunch of money? And I can't. So it's like I said, if anybody has an audience with Phil Murphy, you know, but it, I mean, I don't know if anybody's been to Trenton. I see like some people have been to Trenton. I mean, everybody should come and see our venue and like support. I mean, just come because like, like I said, we are the cannabis culture. We're what it was all about. Not even cannabis, marijuana. I hate even to call it cannabis because it was marijuana when I was 16. It was weed. It was reefer. And nothing changed about it except somebody in a suit and a tie, some white dude, found out he could make a lot of money for it. He said, oh, let's call it cannabis and people will think it's good. Fuck you. It's the same shit. And I'm not fucking changing what I call it. And it just pisses me off. So, and I've actually had people when I'm saying, I'm like, oh, the dog ate a marijuana cookie. Oh, my God. You know? Oh, call it cannabis. What the hell is the difference? He still ate the cookie. What is the <laughs> difference between, you know? So, like I said, that everybody gets caught up in that stuff. I'm not changing. I'm not changing when I call it. 
But I think that New Jersey, we really need to, even people that are going to vote for this, this referendum when it comes through, there's no social, uh, no, no social equity in there. There's no compensation for people. There's no home growth. There's nothing in there. So people are like, oh, why are you voting against it? Why are you talking against it? Don't you want legalization? Free the weed, free the people. Uh, that, and that's all I have to say. So if you believe in that, I left things down there for NJ Weed Man's joint so everybody can come down and, and partake and do what they do. But um, like I said, fuck the law, smoking anyhow. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> Thank you, Debbie. And she just reminded me, I saw an ad for one of these, uh, the six dispensaries. One of them was looking to hire a head grower for the uh, facility and it said no growing experience required <laughs> what does that say about the industry in new jersey <laughs> head grower no growing experience required <laughs> but so we have one more speaker for today and it is someone i am proud <laughs> to call a friend and a comrade. I have known Dr. Sedia for a while now, like two years maybe. And she is always someone who will stand up for justice, no matter what kind of justice it is, if it's economic justice, if it's racial justice, if it's, you know, just general, every justice that we are lacking in society. She's someone who's willing to stand up for it. And she also runs the cannabis miner out of Stockton. <laughs> so this is an amazing program where people can really get some education that no one else is providing anywhere. And she also talks about ecology too. There's a lot of ecology to be discussed with cannabis. You know, most things that are plastic can be made out of hemp. And what kind of impact are these growing facilities having? And so she's just a wealth of knowledge, and I'm so ha glad to have her here today. Welcome, Dr. Katerina Sedia. Thank you, Heather. Um, hi, everyone. So as Heather said, Stockton does have a cannabis miner program. This is the first in the nation, and we designed it as a miner so it can work pretty much with any area students kind of want to enter. And the reason we started this minor, uh, well, there are many reasons why we started this minor. I can tell you about why I ended up heading it. And reason number one is um, the industry came to the state that's probably going to stay here. There will be jobs and jobs adjacent to the industry. Uh, and because they're going to be jobs, you know, like we kind of want our students to get them. So, so you know, it's it is kind of funny because academics kind of always get slammed for being, you know, an ivory tower and not providing any kind of practical education or experience. We say, how about the cannabis miner? Everybody goes, not like that. <laughs> uh, but here we all are. Uh, and the other reason, which is perhaps more personal for me, is. Uh, we talk about the industry, as Debbie mentioned, oftentimes, you know, multinational corporate out of state, and we completely ignore things that this industry brings with it. Uh, I'm an ecologist, so I know you cannot just ever change just one thing. You cannot introduce a whole new industry in the state and have everything else stay the same. In fact, we know that nothing will stay the same because of it. And uh, we started this minor so people can perhaps, you know, kind of look at how this industry will affect things that they're already working on or interested in. Uh, for example, I've seen numbers, again, you know, I will not like bet money on those numbers because, of course, this is the industry which is notoriously hard to measure. But the energy demand from this industry is something like 2% nationwide. So it's not a small number. A lot of window growers are sucking up a lot of electricity. So fossil fuels, like what is happening there? Like what kind of impact is it actually going to have? Like all this indoor grow, especially, you know. Um, we also want to know this industry is going to come to the state. And we already know that many of the wealthier townships opted out of having a dispensary in the area. So the question is, if wealthy municipalities are opting out from having this, you know, smelly dispensary anywhere within the town limits, where are they going to go? 
And the answer, of course, they will go to uh, usually less affluent communities, oftentimes communities of color. What kind of imp impact is it going to have on rents? We need renters justice. We need support for renters. We need basically some kind of affordable housing. And even though New Jersey already has affordable housing program, it will get squeezed because after it goes recreational, there will be people buying up properties to open lounges, you know, and whatnot. So I went to Denver last year. I've been to Denver before many times. Uh, and everybody who drives an Uber there, and, you know, I when I go to Denver, I just fly, you know, and I uh, take an Uber and I talk to people. And everybody who drives an Uber, very unscientific sample of like five people, everybody who drives an Uber also works as a night guard as a dispensary. And uh, where they were previously were able to afford an apartment on a single salary, they now have two salaries and they share an apartment with five other guys. So, I mean, it is naive for us to think that it's not going to happen in New Jersey, that the rents will not go sky high. Then, of course, there is the uh, prison aspect, which disproportionately affects uh, black communities. And uh, we have been uh, working with a couple of entities. Uh, one current applicant for, I'm, I'm kind of being vague because uh, this is not the entity that was granted the license yet, so I don't want to kind of uh, talk too early, but they are interested in running expungement clinics. And this is a black owned company. They want to run expungement clinics in addition to basically having a dispensary. So we're partnering up with them. Uh, we are also interested in providing job training programs for people, as was mentioned, felons can get jobs. We're interested in giving job training and actually hiring people who um, basically have a record. Because, you know, if we're talking about expungement, if we're talking about expungement, we'll have a population that is freshly released out of prison and they cannot get a job and they prefer the industry where they're supposed to go. So we're working with one of the unions in the state to uh, provide an apprenticeship and job training program. And uh, generally, we're kind of looking to expand into the space, not only to look at the impacts of how this industry will affect everything else in the state, but specifically how will it affect the most marginalized, the poorest communities, the communities of color, and what can we do to mitigate this harm? Because we know that whenever things change, there will be harm and the harm will not be evenly distributed. So this is basically what we are looking to recognize and mitigate. And we talk to legislators as well, sort of trying to get them. I think a lot of them do recognize that like expungement is kind of a necessity, but they do not necessarily recognize everything else that comes with it. And of course, you know, the issue with expungement, as I'm sure Debbie knows, is it is kind of very limited. It will not affect people who have been, for example, uh, they oftentimes talk about like, oh, we'll do expungement for users, but not for dealers. Well, users oftentimes are dealers. I mean, it's just like, what is a dealer? Like if you're going to pick up, you know, an ounce for yourself and your friend, are you a dealer now? Yeah, you are. You know, you know so, so so basically users and dealers, those are not airtight categories. And it is very easy to disenfranchise one. And this is why I think it's like it's kind of important to push for expungement of all drug related offenses, regardless of the scale, regardless of the role a person may have played, and basically like not split hairs about it. And basically this is something obviously, you know, we are a state university, we have very limited power, but we have been trying to talk to legislators and um, other sort of community-based entities, and we have been uh, advocating for that as well. So that's, it. oh, and we also, I'm sorry, like, my university will yell at me if I don't do this. Uh, but we also have an online certificate program in cannabis studies. And this is not for students. Basically, anybody can take it. It's continuing ed. And our continuing ed department is currently working on making it a credentialing type of program. So basically, you know, we are talking to uh, dispensaries in the state, so they, they may actually recognize our certification. So if any of you are interested, we have it. It's all online. And we... Part of this program is a lecture series, and Jersey Woodman is one of the speakers. <laughs> All right.
right, so I wanted to open it up now for questions from the audience. Did you have that wireless mic? <laughs> <laughs> so check 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 <laughs> all right so did anyone have any questions that they wanted to ask any of our amazing panelists up here Um, if you wanted to get it, some sort of, uh, well, get a card to be able to purchase legally, do, do, does you, do you go on some sort of registry, like government registry? No. So, you mean like you as a like, Yeah, me I as mean, a card holder or like, like does my name, does the no. government have my name? No, no, in some it sort actually of falls under HIPAA, so, you know, your license is not, or your medical ID card is not tied to your driver's license. So if you got pulled over, they're not going to be like, oh, you're a medical marijuana patient. They have no clue. Okay. It's completely private. Hmm? The state does. The state does. They have a separate, um, they have a separate um, area. It's the, it's the MMUPDP. So everything is separate. They have their own phone number, their own people, their own, you know, a division. And it all kind of stays right there. It is not tied to anything else. So nobody would know unless you really tell them. Who's next? I was just looking for cooking classes. Will you happen to have cooking classes? Actually, we're looking into doing that. So okay. Anyone else? I don't have a question. Um, however, I did not know who I was coming here to see, but I found that there were several people. Wednesday, yes. met you on Facebook. <laughs> you connected me to Dana. Yes. <laughs> I went to Freehold with the doctor, Dana. Yes. Then the weed man's joint. <laughs> <laughs> and went to Stockton for the career fair, and I, I just so got the email about the, um, the, the session. So I did not have a clue who was going to be here, <laughs> and we're all connected. We're all connected. I, I am just so happy and proud to really get to meet some of the people that I have been interacting with online. And now to see it in person, I just would love more um, connectivity in the South Jersey area. I was just in Pennsylvania yesterday, you know, and I'm like, why can't we have this in South Jersey? I go to New York all of the time. I'm tired of commuting. I have been commuting for 15 years and I want something local. So happy to meet you. Good to see you again. We'll be connecting with you and Weed Man's Joint will always be in my heart. <laughs> And if anyone isn't already a member, we do have a separate Facebook group, uh, New Jersey, I think it's Women in Weed, Women in Weed, New Jersey. Um, you know, you can friend me. Um, I'm one of the admins. Dana's one of the admins. Um, I think there's a few. When, yeah, Wednesday's one of the admins. So we can get you added to that group. And in that group, we're sharing a lot of women-centric events. Um, like I said, we're going to keep this going. We're going to keep doing these kind of forums throughout all of South Jersey, take it to Philly. Um, so if you're not in that group yet, get in that group. And we're trying to make it a really thriving community. Yes. Starting an organization. <laughs> it is Cannabis Lifestyle for Seniors. I've just launched it on a Facebook group. The website is not up yet. But I want to educate my age group about the cannabis and about how they could use it. Going to the dispensaries, yeah, you have to stretch your dollars <laughs> if you get it from the dispensary. And so, yes, I am um, starting an organization, so I would really love any support that you guys can give me. Oh, really. um, just one more thing. Um, I, I have a card, so I, I know what it takes. Now, I go to a different doctor. <laughs> I had to, in case no one has their card, it cost me $400 for the cons consultation. And then three months later, I have to go back for another hundred. So that was the, so they changed the laws. Like, <laughs> so they changed the laws in New Jersey that you could, you could do um, up to a year now, but 
the doctors, they could still do it how they want. So a lot of doctors are still doing it that way where Canacare, we do it for the year. It's 300. You come in, you get your education. We register you. We do your paperwork. You see the doctor and you come back in, you know, next year. If you wanted to come back six months down the road, nine months, there's no charge. So it's no, only the first year. Um, and then the second year, it would be $250. As of now, I mean, that could always change. However, you do have to pay for a license with New Jersey. That is two years or $20 or $20 if you qualify for their discounts. Um, but there are a lot of doctors now that are still taking advantage of their patients doing it exactly that. Every doctor does. So for the year, come see Canada Care. We give you for the years, you know, and you would actually be transferring in. So it's. Yeah, yeah, so um, one of the things that hasn't been touched on it's uh, with the cost and everything is that urine samples, blood samples, these things are not required for medical cannabis certification. Right. So just keep that in mind when you're vetting your doctors because they will charge your insurance the extra five, six hundred dollars and then also get your money out of pocket. They'll find too. any way to take advantage so of you. That's if they happening can. all states as well. Yeah. So just you know, do your homework, make sure that, you know, you're with a reputable company that's not going to take advantage of you. 200. Which, but that's for the actual license itself. So most states give the discount if you're on you know, government assistance, uh, food stamps, disability. Senior, veteran, stuff along those lines. Did you have a question? My question is, I I had it real easy getting a prescription for my doctor. I have cancer. So they gave me the prescription. It didn't cost me anything, okay, because I'm a patient. Mm -hmm. So I applied, and this was in August. I still do not have a card because they're fighting with me whether I should pay a hundred dollars or twenty dollars i think because i'm on disability so i showed them my disability card i showed them all my stuff i got my picture taken oh we want something else from those so people. they will the only thing they will accept is the original disability award letter right and i sent that uh, that's too old they want something well so you yeah so you just have to go online to ssa.gov no, no, no. You just have to go online to ssa.gov, create an account for yourself if you don't have one already, and you can just download the original letter, and it'll be dated with recent date. That's what they're looking for. It's been since August, so I have to go like... I mean, I, I've actually told a lot of patients in that same thing, just pay the 100 I would have if they would just charge me. But they they will. Well, well, what? But like then something's wrong. Yeah. Something's wrong. Do you have your paperwork? Then something just, you probably just need to go online and we upload your stuff and then call the state and just, it shouldn't be that long. There's something holding it up. And if you have a reference number and you've already submitted documents, you could just call them. They'll take it off your file and it'll go right through for the hundred dollars. That's what I would I mean, rather than stressing yourself out over $80, you've just wasted six months. And that happens to a lot of people. You could just call, they'll remove it and you can just pay it. Okay. Sorry. Hi. Um, I, I go to a doctor. He was my primary physician. Well, he actually wasn't. It was somebody else. But I, I went to him. I said, I'm looking for a, a reputable medical marijuana doctor, not some guy who like charges, you know, $1,600 right. and plays games right. with you. And he turned around. He said, hi. He doesn't want to. He didn't want to announce it. Yeah. So. It doesn't cost me anything. It doesn't bill anybody anything. It's so that's because he's your right. he's your primary care doctor. Yeah, and he's been no right, right. <laughs> so because you're his patient, he's just yeah. doing it as part of the services. Yeah. And so I mean, so and I know that there are more of them out there, and I think that there should be more of a directory of those kind of doctors out there. You see, I'm I'm actually looking to change my doctor, but I can't because right. I so have a, good deal a, with a it. lot of those doctors they don't put it out there because they don't want like so so we are in are in, in a 
enrollment and, you know, a, an education center. So if you have your own, you know, doctor and he only does his own, you know, on a patient. He doesn't want to attract people from the outside. Right. And, that, and, and, and so they keep it quiet. That's why wow. they have a, the registry where some doctors go on, like our doctors would be on there. But then there's some like yours that don't want it to be known because he doesn't want all the phone calls and the people looking to get the medical marijuana card. He only wants to help his existing patients. See, but your but your doctors get a fee, so it, it, most it, doctors it's more do. In their, it's more in their interest to be known that that they're out well, there doing that, whereas it's not in, in the well, you, and that's what I think needs your, to be changed. Well, that, your doctors. Well, well, what needs to be changed is on a federal level. They need to accept insurance. Right. Well, right now, have, it's still federally yeah. illegal, so you can't use insurance. Yeah. So your doctor, you are there. He, you know, on a, you you are not actually paying for it. So you're there for other reasons, and he's just right. And, right yeah, and that's what he does. And now it's right there. I mean, I, he didn't want to do that at first, but I said, look, he makes himself back there anyway for other right. medications. So just you know. But then there's a lot of people that don't want their doctor to, the to know, you know and they do it separately. It. Like they don't want their doctor to know. Their doctor might be able to also, you know. And they don't want to, they want to keep it separate. But those types of doctors, they don't want people knowing because yeah. they only want to help that, their own, own patients. Problem, well, that goes back to the federal level yeah, with insurance. Yeah. Um, it's all about Yeah, I, until recently, state of New Jersey actually required doctors to be registered with the state and listed. And this is why a lot of doctors actually right. didn't want to yeah. be on that list Correct. because you get, you're on the state registry and they felt that it will actually turn away the existing patients because they didn't want to be known as like weed doctor. And uh, especially, you know, somebody was like respectable family practitioner. And it's only recently that the state made this directory voluntary and a lot of more, a lot more doctors actually ended up getting licenses because of that, because yeah, until yeah. then they didn't want to anything to do with it. So requiring them to be on this registry doesn't really work that well. It, it always back to the federal level. Yeah, it is. Right, but with insurance, it goes to the federal. That's the whole If they made that legal, then every doctor would want to do it. And then it can go to the federal. Any other questions? Anyone? No questions. It's a good response to. Just in response to what you just said, and I came in late, and I apologize if it was already covered, but this registry of um, doctors, is it something that we can have access to? Would we be able to peek in and see who those doctors are? So on the state website, I think it's njmmp.gov.nj, any doctor that's um, on that list, there is a list of doctors. And it's also on the Department of Health website as well. But it only has the ones that opted in to be on that list. There's thousands that are not on that list. Oh, okay. They opted out, uh, you know, so they're not on there, but they are licensed to prescribe it. So they could be licensed to prescribe and it, not but be not on the, on the list. Correct. They don't want to be on the list. Okay. But there is a pretty big list of doctors, probably okay. a couple thousand. Beautiful basket. Yeah. 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 So, you know, and it's all, it's all by county. So okay. you can just look at it by county. So, so I'll, I might have to get that. Uh, Are you looking to get your medical marijuana card or? My, for my son. So we, we could actually help you out. We're from County Care Doctors. We okay. have five offices in New Jersey. Our information's right there okay. on the table. And that's Erica. We work together. Hey, Erica. Okay. But she could answer any. All right. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? Nope. Not to get political, <laughs> but I'm just letting you know. Bernie Sanders said by executive order, he will legalize it federally. <laughs> Just real quick, Debbie, because you said you're a nurse, like an RN, BSN. Like, how does that work with your medical card? Because I've been asking Dana. Dana's my good friend. So um, I've been trying to ask her, and I wasn't sure. I mean, is it just based on, like, where you're working, if they're drug testing you and things like that? I mean, I smoke, but... Um, I don't, I didn't get drug tested. I'm in home care for that very reason, for that very reason. <laughs> it's based on where you work. So I got the card because I just thought it was ironic that I could qualify, get a card. And I got it from my neurologist. I had back surgery. I have stenosis. I have sciatica. So I had this, I've had it for five years. 
So I thought it was ironic that I could be have possess a prescription, be qualified as a medical marijuana patient, but not use in the state of New Jersey. Now, I'm not an idiot. So when I was working at St. Joe's Hospital in Patterson, my company was taken over by Meridian Health. Oh, my God. And then my business partner was arrested and our place was raided. Now, all of a sudden I get called into the office. What are you doing? Blah, 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 blah. And then all of a sudden everybody had to take a mandatory drug test. Well, I'll take a drug test any day a week. I don't smoke. I don't use and I'm not an idiot. But I have a license in the state of New Jersey that says I can. So even though they're saying you have job protection, you don't. I just didn't get hired by the state of New Jersey because their address is 55 uh, East State Street, and my address is 322 East State Street. There isn't anybody in the state of New, uh, uh, in Mercer County that doesn't know, or, or Trenton. But as a nurse, I can tell you, I wouldn't do it. Because even though NJ can't get 12, all they have to do is make that accusation. Debbie runs a marijuana distribution ring. And people have said that. She knowingly runs a marijuana distribution ring. And all I have to do is say that to you. So you're going to walk out of here and you're going to say, that Debbie, she runs a marijuana distribution <laughs> ring, even though it's not true. So you plant that seed. So I'm thinking to myself, I, you know, I, I make really good money as a nurse. I do. But when I worked at Rutgers, too, I worked at Rutgers. I worked for CINJ, Cancer Institute of New Jersey. We were not allowed to mention medical marijuana because of the schedule of the drug and because of the funding. Well, I mentioned it. And guess what? At 5 o'clock at night, after they saw NJ Weedman in my car, they told me, don't come back. They canceled my contract. So that's the whole thing. So as a nurse, and that's why I said I am a nurse, and, and I don't use it myself, but I'll show you my card. So... What can I say? And and I would, even when I sell the CBD products, because we sell CBD, and CBD has 0.3% THC. And I always say, this can trigger a drug test to be positive. And then NJ Weedman, he's always like, oh, why well, shut up? Why is it not? I said, because it affects some people. So if I go in there and I come, and I bring my prescription. I bring my prescription for everything. But if I bring my prescription for medical marijuana and I test positive for THC, I am not covered by a zero tolerance company, and I will be fired. So, I mean, you can do it, and you're. You have to have the license. I mean, it doesn't necessarily affect your. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, if I test positive, I'm going to get fired. Right. Yeah. But they won't, but a no, I won't. But yeah. you know what? But here's the thing. I. I Just having the license will not affect you. Like it, it won't affect you. That, but but you know what? I don't know if I believe that. And I don't want to be a conspiracy theory nut. I know that I can't. I know that I can't apply for a gun license in the state of New Jersey because I'm a medical marijuana patient. But every other nut that uses Percocet and fentanyl and and heroin addict can apply for a drug. But but you can't apply for a gun permit in the state of New Jersey. That was made by Chris Christie. If you're a medical marijuana patient, and I don't believe that they don't have access to it. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. So, so look, I'm saying for my own self, and I just sit there like, ha, 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 go ahead, drug test me. Drug test the whole company because I'm going to come up negative. Just who I'm standing next to and what I do. And I speak out for the legalization of marijuana, just like Phil Murphy. Why is he working in New Jersey and I'm not? <laughs> like, somebody tell me. Somebody tell me why. But I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. Anyone else? All right. I want to thank you guys so much for being here today. It's been awesome having these conversations with you. And hopefully, oh, I'm being summoned to the front. <laughs> Not in the shot. <laughs> you see, I'm a photographer in real life, so I like to hide behind the camera, not be in front of the camera. <laughs> but that's really hard when you own a media company because people keep making you get in front of a camera. <laughs> But really, thank you guys for coming out here today. Let's keep this conversation going. Join that Facebook group. Reach out to us. Network with each other. Support other women in this industry. We have the power to take it over. And I think we're going to. <laughs> like, think the tides are turning, and I think women are going to take over this industry. And before you guys do leave, I do have to ask you, we are an independent media company. We do not take corporate money for our network. We are funded off of donations. So if any of you guys appreciate what we do, you like our podcasts, you like our events, we have a donation jar over there in the corner. 
anything you can give us, we really appreciate it. It helps keep us going. Um, you can also fund, uh, find us on our website, <laughs> www.njrevolutionradio.com. And on there, we have a donate button. You can support us on PayPal, through Venmo, through Cash App. You can become a Patreon supporter. So anything you can do to help us, we really appreciate it. And it's been great today, guys. Give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> and before you leave don't forget if you haven't visited our vendors yet we still have excellent vendors up and down the hall they'll probably be here for another half hour or so you can still get a massage you can still buy some chocolates just have a good time thank you all for coming out